protesters are on the streets in Brazil as lawmakers vote on a controversial pension reform. Thousands of Walmart workers in Chile go on strike in what could be the country's largest private sector strike in decades. And Nigeria's Islamic movement continues protests to demand the release of their leader. From the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador, this is From the South, and I am Doris Polo. We start in Mexico, where the government led by President Andres Manuel López Obrador faces an opposition that seeks to obstruct strategic projects for the development of the nation. The president has since condemned these actions and announced an important change to his cabinet. After the resignation of Carlos Urzua as Secretary of Finance, President Andres Manuel López Obrador appointed Arturo Herrera head of the agency in charge of managing the national budget. We are committed to change the economic policy which has been imposed on Mexico for 36 years. The changes proposed by President AMLO has raised concern among opposition sectors whose interests are affected, among them the private media whose income from advertising has fallen significantly. Their livelihood is dependent on selling opinions. They sell news to support this governor or that governor. There have also been documented cases of payments to television hosts. Strategic government projects have also faced obstacles. For example, non-governmental organizations linked to business groups have filed 147 legal appeals against the construction of the international airport at the military base of Santa Lucia. What they want is to revive works that was cancelled in Texcoco, located in the state of Mexico, which began during the previous administration. For technical, economic and environmental reasons and due to a lack of transparency, the space where it was going to be built will become an ecological park and Lake Nabor Carrillo will be saved. Other projects which are being hindered include works for the Mayan train, which seeks to reactivate the rail transport of passengers and goods just southeast of the Mexican territory. This as well as the strategic plan to rescue the privatized oil industry after the approval of energy reforms. And unido. They have joint groups that argue against environmental damage and in defense of the community to attack a project that is actually a proposal to spur economic activity for the benefit of the said community. The analysts explain that in this vein, protests are led by elements of the federal police who refuse to join the National Guard. The federal police is publicly supported by former President Felipe Calderón, who is working on the creation of a new political party. Over 10,000 Walmart workers in Chile have gone on strike to demand better salaries in what many are calling the largest private sector strike in the country in decades. According to the Walmart Workers' Union, they are demanding a 4% raise in their salaries, but the company has only offered them 3%. The strike comes after negotiations over a new labor contract broke down earlier this week. The strike has shut down more than a quarter of the approximately 400 stores that Walmart operates in Chile. We do not agree with automation, with polyfunctionality, with everything they want to do. Our salaries are very low and what they offer us is very little. And we agree with everything our union argues for. In the last 30 or 40 years, there has never been such a large strike in the private sector as there is today. We have seen the public sector marching and mobilizing for their rights, but we have never seen a trade union strike in the private sector, and less so at a company like Walmart Chile or Walmart International, because in the end, Walmart is a worldwide chain and is the first time in their history a union is mobilizing in this way. Social movements and trade unions in Brazil are protesting across the country against President Jair Bolsonaro's pension reform. Protesters in Brasilia gathered outside Congress as lawmakers are currently debating the bill with a vote expected soon. 
If the reform passes, Brazilian workers would have to work an extra 10 years on average to qualify for their pension. According to local media, about 300 lawmakers are in favor of the bill, which would be enough to pass it. But the opposition are trying to block the vote today and delay the process until Congress goes into recess. Protesters see the pension reform as a savage attack on the basic rights of workers. So let's take a closer look at what the reform actually involves. If Bolsonaro's pension reform is passed, the number of years someone has worked will no longer count. The new retirement age will be the only thing that determines your pension. That will put at a disadvantage all those who began to work early in life and whose health may have deteriorated or who can no longer find a job. I began selling water when I was 13. Now I am 19 and I sell for cleaning racks to anyone who needs them. That's how we survive, unfortunately, looking for work from when we are kids. According to recent research, Dante's experience is shared by 45% of men and 34% of women in the cities of Brazil, who began to work before they were 15. In the countryside, the figure is higher. 78% of men and 70% of women. That means a majority of the population will be affected by this reform. The government says the aim is to begin to balance the books of the Social Security Institute, whose deficit is three times less than the amount it is owed by big companies. A number of banks and big companies have large arrears in their contributions. There's a lot of tax evasion because the government doesn't invest in tax collectors who would investigate and charge those who are not paying. What's more, the government grants a lot of exemptions which allow companies not to pay. If you factor in all that, the pension system would have a big surplus. The reform adds an average of 10 years onto the time a worker needs to make contributions, puts an end to special pensions for the families of policemen and firemen who die, and cuts by 40% other bereavement pensions. Any debts will have to be renegotiated within 60 months, but there will be exemptions for the military, agricultural exporters, and Pentecostal churches. We are in a period of international counter-revolution, and this is global tendency with extreme neoliberalism and the domination of finance capital. That means the dismantling of social rights, the labor reform and outsourcing imposed by Tema government, which Bolsonaro is now pushing further with his pension reform. With unemployment at 40 million and whole regions of Brazil where life expectancy isn't more than 65, this reform will require workers to make four decades of contributions. According to the opposition and trade unions, that means huge numbers of Brazilians will die without ever drawing a pension. Venezuela's Attorney General says that Enzo Francini Oliveros has been arrested in Spain for the burning alive and murder of Orlando Figuera on May 20, 2017. Venezuela's public ministry had made a request to Interpol for his capture after he was identified in videos. The top prosecutor says that the suspect is accused of public instigation, manslaughter and terrorism. The president of Venezuela, Nicolas Maduro, has met with the European Union's special advisor for Venezuela in the context of the government's dialogue with the opposition taking place in Barbados. Enrique Iglesias, a former Uruguayan foreign minister and a former president of the Inter-American Development Bank, was invited by the government at the end of March in order to consolidate the national dialogue process. It began in Norway on May 14th and has been continuing in Barbados from July 8th. I believe in dialogue, and in a dialogue, all sides had to sit down and be prepared to compromise. I have done that many times, and I will continue to do it, because I am mandated by millions of Venezuelans, as President of the Republic, as Head of State, and Head of the Government. It's a very clear mandate. I'm not here because I want a raffle, or because I proclaim myself President, or because the Gringo Embassy put me here. I am here because of a vote, an expression of national sovereignty. The president of Bolivia, Evo Morales, has held a meeting with his Surinamese counterpart, Desi Butersi, in the capital of Suriname, Paramaribo. 
The two leaders signed a number of agreements, including a memorandum of understanding on political, economic and commercial in issues. Visa. Bolivia and Suriname have also agreed to hold regular meetings in the future to assess aspects of their bilateral relations, international developments and matters of mutual benefit. In the name of the government and the people of Suriname, I want to offer a warm welcome to the president and delegation of the plurinational state of Bolivia. We are hoping for a fruitful talks and a healthy result for, the, for both the people. The presidents of Evo Morales shows the way for indigenous people around the world. And we congratulate him for his achievements and for what he has done for the world he represents. First of all, on behalf of the delegation, I'd like to thank you for the very warm welcome. Maybe our two countries have been considered as small on our continent, but with the excellent social, political and economic work done, we're on the path to becoming big. In Bolivia, thanks to the social progress made, we've started to change our dear country. We are responsible for leading our countries, the countries previously called African-American, humiliated and discriminated against, enslaved even. And you have led your country with certainty. In Bolivia, after more than 500 years of subjugation, we, the indigenous community, once again govern ourselves. This is the extraordinary link between Suriname and Bolivia. Bahamas Prime Minister Dr. Hubert Minnis has made a call to action on climate change, given the Bahamas' vulnerability as a low-lying, sea-encircled country. If the projected sea level rise is reached by 2050, up to 12% of the island's territory could be lost, especially in areas where the main tourism assets are located. The Prime Minister has called on Bahamians to be at the forefront of the efforts to reverse this terrifying phenomenon. He was speaking during his Independence Day message as Bahamas recently celebrated 46 years free from British rule. We must and ever at a be pace vigilant that in I don't think has ever our happened biodiversity, before. addressing pollution, protecting our marine environment and resources, and combating other environmental threats. With the historic challenge of the exhilarating and life-threatening effects of climate change, united, we must stand to save our Bahamas from rising sea levels and other destructive effects of a warming planet. We'll take a short break now. Join us again in a minute. Welcome back. Cuba's National Assembly has concluded the first round of debate, which was held after the approval of the new constitution backed by the majority of Cubans in a popular referendum. The three bills which were debated will be submitted to Saturday's plenary for analysis and subsequent approval. Our correspondent in Havana, Alien Fernandez, has the details. Here at the Conference Palace of Havana, the ten commissions of the National Assembly of People's Power have wound up debate to pave the legislative path to support the new constitution. And so debate has effectively ended on the 38 clauses that will decide on Cuba's economical, political and social life. After a careful review of government's work on each of these areas, deputies each presented their reports. The main purpose of the session was to analyze the progress and the setbacks of foreign investment in Cuba. What was said is that there is great potential for foreign investment. Even as the U.S. government has tightened Cuba travel prohibitions, there has been growth in the island's tourism sector. In 2018, more than 4 million tourists visited Cuba. There are also other sectors that show great potential like foreign trade, transport and telecommunications. In relation to this, Cuba's President Miguel Díaz-Canel mentioned on Wednesday that the U.S. attempts to interfere in Cuba's foreign investment is more palpable than it is in any other sector. He also suggested that works continues towards improving foreign investment without harming Cuba's sovereignty and independence. This, as the Foreign Trade Ministry keeps working on reducing the time between evaluation and the project's approval. Meanwhile, deputies will keep debating and hearing the ministry's reports until the weekend, when the plenary session will take place. Then, the assembly is expected to approve three new laws. 
a new fishing law, a new symbols law, and a new electoral law. The latter aims to broaden the legislative exercise to support a new constitution. That was Alian Fernandez with that report. Now, Trinidad and Tobago's Prime Minister does not foresee a reduction in oil or gas production for the year 2019. Dr. Keith Rowley was responding to standards and Poe's recent lowering of the country's long-term foreign and local currency sovereign credit ratings as it projects a reduction in commodities. Dr. Rowley said his recent travels overseas to meet with all major energy players was to make sure this prediction on gas does not come to pass. Regarding oil, he said Heritage Petroleum is now drilling 16 to 18 wells when former state-owned oil company Petrotrin drilled zero. Petrojam Limited is now supplying the Barbados National Terminal Company with oil following the closure of the state-owned Petrotrin oil refinery in Trinidad and Tobago last November. The deal is reportedly more competitive than the previous one with Petrotrin. The Trinidad and Tobago government shut down the refinery after complaining of billions of dollars in losses annually. Petrojam is Jamaica's only petroleum company and is wholly owned by the country's government. We move now to Guyana, where the president has rejected five of the 11 names submitted by the opposition leader as possible candidates for the chair of the Elections Commission. Following a two-hour meeting between both parties on Tuesday, four names have been shortlisted, while two are under active consideration. It's all part of a process to ensure credible elections at the earliest possible date, following the passage of a no-confidence motion against the government. The opposition says it wants to ensure that the selection process is transparent. In El Salvador, human rights activists have called on the Legislative Assembly to recognize their work and ensure their safety as threats leveled against them grows. Sonia Sanchez leads a women's rights movement in the municipality of Santo Tomas. Apart from fighting for women's rights, her organization also promotes self-sustainability programs. But human rights defenders in El Salvador are often criminalized, making their work very risky. You have to keep up the fight and you can't let them intimidate you. But it is also hard not to be scared when someone calls you saying someone paid them to kill you or kidnap someone from your family. It is hard, but we can't let these threats stop us from defending human rights. Given how dangerous their work can be, human rights organizations demand that El Salvador's Legislative Assembly passes a bill that recognizes their work and assigns protection for human rights defenders. Defending human rights in this country continues to be a high-risk task. It's not recognized as a proper profession because there are no degrees for it. But you do not need titles to defend and promote human rights. According to a 1998 the United Nations declaration, any person or group can promote and defend human rights. The relaunch of the campaign title, You Defend My Rights, I Defend Your Work, seeks to highlight the work of human rights activists on issues like the environment, the LGBTQ community, women, journalists, forced displacement, youth and indigenous people. We have human rights violations in places like Nahuizalco, where the river is contaminated, dams are being built, and where indigenous and social leaders are being persecuted or live in exile. We fear for our lives. In El Salvador, fighting for people's rights to have access to clean water, food sovereignty, and a clean environment can cost you your life. But despite the risks involved, human rights defenders continue their work for the sake of all citizens. France has admitted it is the owner of deadly U.S.-made missiles found at a base in Tripoli, used by Khalifa Haftar fighters. The admission raises fresh questions about France's role in Libya's conflict. A French military advisor had initially denied that the missiles were transferred to Haftar by his country. 
but later the French military acknowledged the weapons were meant to be used in counter-terrorism operations, adding that they were defective and meant to have been destroyed. The missiles, usually sold only to close U.S. allies, were recovered by Libyan government forces in Tripoli. This development has implications on the U.N. arms embargo and would put Washington at odds over Libya policy with France. Also in Libya, hundreds of survivors of the recent airstrike on a migrant detention center in Tripoli have marched to the UN refugee camp after waiting in vain for evacuation. About 300 survivors made the roughly four-hour trek to the UN Commission on Refugees Center. So far, only about 50 people have been transferred to a safe place by the UN agency, while hundreds are still at risk. Survivors of the attack had been on hunger strike, pleading for the UN to guarantee their safety. Shifting gears now, members of the Islamic movement in Nigeria are continuing protests as they demand the release of their leader. This comes one day after clashes with police left several dead. Protesters claim jailed leader Ibrahim Zagzaki is sick and needs medical attention. Zagzaki has been in custody since 2015 for allegedly attempting to kill the army chief. His detention has led to repeated protests in Abuja and several northern cities. On Tuesday, the National Assembly went on lockdown after shots were fired, leaving three people dead and police officers injured. Do you know, on last week, Thursday, we were at the National Assembly to meet some members and they come out to address us. They told us that they will call us. The issue of Sheikh Zezeki health is a master of urgency. They are going to address it urgently. We should wait for them. Within 24 hours, they will call us. We waited until 128 hours. There was never a call from these people. And that is why we decided to go to the National Assembly to hear from them. We'll take a short break now. Join us again after this. Welcome back. A North Korean delegation led by a senior ruling party official has left Pyongyang for China. The delegation is set to meet with representatives of the Chinese Communist Party in an attempt to bolster relations between the two nations. Last month, Chinese President Xi Jinping visited North Korea for the first time since he came to power and held productive talks with the leader, Kim Jong-un. Iran has welcomed France's efforts to salvage the 2015 nuclear deal. The agreement between China, Russia and a number of European Union countries was thrown into disarray when the United States unilaterally withdrew, imposing an economic blockade on Iran. France's top diplomat, Emmanuel Bonn, is visiting Tehran in an effort to ease tensions. Iran's President Hassan Rouhani has said that the country remains committed to the deal, pointing out that it was the U.S. who broke the terms of the agreement. These Americans, who have generally violated the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, have now called for an emergency meeting of the Board of Governors of the U.N. Atomic Agency Board, asking why Iran has abandoned some of its JCPOA commitments. This is a funny story that the U.S. is weaving. And such things are rare in the political history of the world. Protesters have taken to the streets of Rome, Italy, to condemn the Interior Minister's attempt at evicting low-income residents from occupied buildings. Residents, migrants and union members say the eviction plans would lead to hundreds more living on the streets. Protesters blamed Matteo Salvini's and the governor of Lazio region, Nicola Zingaretti, for depriving people of housing and jobs. The peaceful protests were held in front of the regional council and were monitored by a heavy police presence. Salvini is a propaganda minister who criminalizes the poorest, but he has the same interests as the European Union. The EU chooses neoliberal policies based on its economic interests, but these measures do not apply to those in power or the European Central Bank, only to the poor. Salvini says there are migrants that are invading us, they steal from us. But those who live on the streets know that when they are evicted, it weren't migrants doing it. 
Those with jobs know that it's not migrants who exploit them. The homeless know that it's not the migrants who deny them a home. It's Salvini as well as Governor Zingaretti who deny us housing, jobs, health care and education. And now we move to sports. New Zealand has advanced to the Cricket World Cup final after knocking out India by 18 runs in a sensational match at Old Trafford in the United Kingdom. India lost the match after scoring 221 from 49.3 overs, while New Zealand managed 239 for 8. India chasing a 240 to win were reduced by batsmen's Rohit Sharma and Virat Kohli, misfires of 24 for 4 and 92 for 6. New Zealand's Ross Taylor top scored with 74 from 90 balls, which added 28 runs in the remaining 3.5 overs of their innings. Thursday's match between England and Australia will determine who faces New Zealand in the finals. And with that, we've come to the end of this news brief. You can find these and many other stories on our website at telesurenglish.net. And join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. For Telesur English, I'm Doris Polo. Thank you for watching.